Good afternoon. This is a meeting of the Discipline Subcommittee of the California Paraprofessional Program Working Group. Regulation. I'm sorry, regulation. I apologize. The regulation Subcommittee. Um, I'd like to take roll now. Um, Hartston? Here. Sarush? Here. Thank you. Okay, do you want to see if there is any public comment? I see one attendee. If you'd like to make public comment, raise your hand. Two, is there any public comment today? Nope, okay, let's get started. So we've got Andrew and Randy here, and I believe uh, they're going to focus today on advertising rules and the work that the um, closing the justice gap working group will be doing in that regard. Should is that where we should start? So we could let Randy and Andrew go. Sounds good. Okay. Do you want to introduce the topic? Um, Greg, or how, how should we begin? Um, sure, sure. I, I just wanted to um, to highlight the fact that um, the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group is um, a working group that also is springing out of the ATEL's uh, final report, and they are covering a number of different topics, including the regulatory sandbox, um, where we're going to look at different types of business formats between lawyers and non-lawyers, and and perhaps in a sandbox environment, relax rules and allow them to uh, experiment. But one of the other one of the other key aspects of the charter for that group is to address our current advertising rules for attorney attorneys. Um, it turns out that when we adopted a new set of a comprehensive revision to the rules of professional conduct in 2018, shortly thereafter, the ABA. Did a, did a major revision of the advertising rules for the model rules. So, um, so we are going to circle back and see whether or not it makes sense to align with this new national trend that seems to be emerging. Um, and the group has only met once, right, Randy? I think, I think they're closing the justice gap group has already only met once and probably it's going to take a while before they turn to the advertising rules, but I, mm -hmm. I thought it might be helpful to have Randy and Andrew come on and just talk about how the issue is going to be teed up, uh, what the ABA did with the pre-existing rules and the issues that the Closing the Justice Gap uh, working group will be addressing in that regard. Great. Randy, Andrew? So let me just go first and, and give a little bit of uh, background. Uh, the advertising rules are in the seven series of the California Rules of Professional Conduct. And as uh, amended operative uh, 2018, um, they did consider what was at the time when the commission completed its work, the current then current version of the model rules. And one of the main uh, changes that were made to the advertising rules was that we did adopt the, the model uh, rules framework for advertising. California had had a very unique approach to advertising, defining communication, defining solicitation, setting standards for both. California also had, and in fact continues to have, authorization from the Supreme Court for the board to adopt advertising standards. And these standards are presumptions affecting the burden of proof in a disciplinary proceeding as to what communications would be viewed as false, deceptive, misleading, or otherwise uh, in violation of the rules. And so we adopted the model rules framework. Uh, we retained the authority for the advertising standards, uh, but all of the uh, standards were essentially either migrated into the black letter and adapted for the actual rule text itself or became a comment. We also uh, eliminated uh, the requirement uh, in the former rule uh, for lawyer retain uh, ads uh, for two years. The uh, rules also adopted the concept of uh, real-time uh, electronic communication as being an indicia of uh, sort of direct advertising or solicitation, if you will. 
And of course, while we were working on this um, in, I guess it's 2015, 2016, the Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers were also conducting a study of the la uh, lawyer advertising rules. And they came up with recommendations uh, that uh, I, I can't remember exactly who sponsored it through the House of Delegates, but eventually got through uh, the ABA and was considered by the ABA and were largely an impetus for what they did with the advertising rules uh, when they revised it in, in 2018. And so the charter for ADL says, basically you need to take another look at the advertising rules. Uh, in 2018, the moment they were issued, they were still current, but now you need to take a look again. And so what uh, the charter uh, contemplates is what uh, Adels uh, really looked at at the time is the uh, April reports in terms of what changes ought to, what they thought ought to be made and what was adopted uh, by the model rules. Um, because we still have the authority to adopt uh, board, uh, ad uh, board adopted advertising standards, that could still change the way uh, California approaches the advertising rules. Um, but uh, it does seem, this is my just personal observation that the trend is to try to have advertising rules uh, that reflect essentially a national, a national standard on professional responsibility. And that plays into the goals of both ADELS and the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group because uh, there is this belief that advertising rules, if they're overly detailed, overly specific, uh, examples being such things as must include affirmative disclaimers in X point size, uh, that it could impair the ability to have, I don't wanna call it innovative advertising, but advertising we see right now today in terms of uh, social media, uh, search engine optimization, and, and those types of activities. And so if uh, the consumer is obtaining access to legal services through means that are not a fit with the current regulations, then that needs, that needs to be looked at. And I, I believe a, a CTJG, the Closing Justice Gap Working Group, uh, will look closely at, at that. And Andrew, I don't know if you wanna walk through sort of the bullet points of the specific topics that are on the table, because I think that might be helpful just to, to make this a little more concrete. Sure, just uh, broadly speaking, I think a lot of the edits that, uh, or the amendments that the ABA made were streamlining edits and they are made um, for the reasons, you know, Randy stated, which is to not over uh, regulate uh, advertising and, and solicitation. And there seems to be a national trend in that direction. Um, the standard and the pro the general prohibition for advertising is just um, don't include anything that's false or misleading. And um, the current California rules, which were modeled after the ABA rules before they were amended, um, <clears throat> are all anchored on rule 7.1. So you'll notice I believe 7.2, 3, 4, and 5 always refer back to 7.1 and say, you know, in conjunction or in compliance with 7.1, a lawyer shall not do whatever the additional um, uh, prohibitions are found in 7.2 through 7.5. And 7.1 is that a lawyer shall not make a false or misleading communication about the lawyer or the lawyer's services. And that is the emanating principle that informs um, the, the rest of the rules. And so 7.4 and 7.5 talk about how a lawyer can hold him or herself out uh, with respect to um, legal specialization status, as well as um, how firm names or trade names can be used. And um, those are independent separate rules currently 7.4 and 7.5. And um, those who argue in favor of further amending these rules will say those are all captured by the concept of false or misleading uh, advertising. And then the, uh, and so the ABA amendments have eliminated those rules and either added them as examples for false or misleading advertisement in comments to rule 7.1 or um, ha have done away with some of the, the provisions altogether. Uh, the other aspect is with respect to solicitation. Um, they um, 
try to permit um, uh, real-time electronic communication, which uh, some rules currently uh, prohibit um, because they think there's a different uh, policy concern there when communicating with someone electronically as opposed to in person. And we can talk about the paternalistic uh, policy for uh, the prohibition on in-person solicitation if, if, if we're so interested. And then um, the other aspect with respect to solicitation is to provide an exception uh, for in-person solicitation for um, sophisticated consumers of um, legal services or those known uh, to have received legal services previously that the uh, policy prohibition um, is lessened uh, with those individuals uh, for persons um, known to have uh, obtained uh, legal services previously. And that's, I mean, there are finer uh, detail uh, points um, we could go through, but I think just broadly and conceptually, I hope what Randy said in conjunction um, with what I just described, hope uh, frames just this issue generally for you. Amos, please, I know this is um, a topic you've brought up on a couple of occasions. And I, I think where you've been leaning is, is not um, maybe somewhat inconsistent with the potentially loosening up of the advertising rules on attorneys. Not so. I don't. I don't know if that's true or not. But I would be interested in everyone's thoughts about because I. I assume the goal is for the paraprofessional program working group not to try to get ahead of itself and take on what's in the other uh, working group. And so we're our job is not to try to streamline the advertising rules in any way. And I, I think the goal would be to parallel them. In, in some way or adopt them and, and maybe, you know, with slight modifications with maybe a caveat that if the uh, other working group decides more streamlined rules are appropriate for attorneys that may also apply to paraprofessionals too. I think that's the approach I would suggest is that, you know, we not try to streamline advertising rules <laughs> ourselves. So I think and I went through, I don't know if you circulated it to everyone, but I went through the seven series of rules to see uh, maybe how they could be adopted. I don't know if you're doing that independently. And I, the, the only, there were only one or two things that really jumped out at me that I thought would, would be important to include. And Fariba, please jump in here. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, the, the concern is that um, paraprofessionals are not attorneys and that and that they're advertising legal services. So I think it is appropriate to require some indication that they are performing legal services, but they're not an attorney uh, in some way. Um, that is the approach that is taken with immigration consultants. And I think there might be some other examples. I'm not tied to the language or the font type or, or whatever. So there's a way to incorporate that, but just some that they're, that they're not an attorney. Um, and I think, uh, and include the, the paraprofessional's name and license number was the other thing that I included. Um, I don't know if that changes, I don't know if that fundamentally changes the way advertising is regulated for paraprofessionals versus attorneys, or I, I'm not sure how that would implicate the changes being considered, because if they're streamlining, hopefully it gets streamlined, but those types of requirements would still exist, right? There would still be uh, under the no false or misleading advertising. The, the concern would be that advertising legal services when you're not an attorney and not disclosing that you're not an attorney is an example of false and misleading advertising, whether it's a special rule or a comment or not. I think that should be something, you know, as we develop rules for paraprofessionals that that is appropriate to include. Uh, you know, again, open to discussion. That's sort of just where I'm coming from, I think. I agree. I, I think really the only difference I see is just a disclosure in there that they're not attorneys. I want to see that. 
Um, also, to the extent that, um, and forgive me, I haven't read all the rules, but to the extent that the rules refer to any specific practice areas that paraprofessionals are not authorized to do under the plan we're coming up with, such as, I don't know, like class action litigation or something like that, or litigation in general. Um, if there are any special rules about that, I, I just, obviously we need to not follow those, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm all for copying the rules that apply to attorneys, but for the special uh, disclosures about not being attorneys and what area of specialization they have selected. And I think open to stream, you know, I would be in support, I think, of streamlined rules for attorneys and paraprofessionals. I do think the ultimate thing is no false or misleading advertising. That's a big umbrella. So I do think you need examples. But here, the obvious example is, you know, pretending to be an attorney when you're not. And that's something I think we can anticipate pretty, pretty easily and clearly in, in the rules. Although I'm not tied to any language specifically, but I think, um, you know, that's something that we should try to regulate. I, I, I tend to agree with you, Amos. I think that the, 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 probably the best approach at this point is to try to streamline these rules with the lawyer rules until they change. Otherwise, I have a feeling um, we may end up standing up this program before the Closing the Justice Gap group finishes their work because it's a two-year process. And I don't know where the chapter seven rules are on the agenda. They're probably <laughs> at the end. So uh, we, I don't think that we need to wait. One thing to keep in mind that Randy mentioned, one of the reasons, one of the big debates in the Rules Revision Commission was whether or not to retain this authority for the Board of Trustees to adopt standards. And, uh, and you, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, if my recollection is wrong, but I think the, the big, um, the, the advocates for ret retaining that authority for the board their argument was it's, it's difficult to change these rules. It, it requires the court's approval. Um, and in order to be nimble and address new forms of advertising, um, it, it allows the board to react almost in real time um, and adopt standards without having to go through court approval as long as that they're conforming with this false and misleading uh, standard. Um, so it gives them a little bit of nimbleness uh, to and, and, and so that may be something with these set, this set of rules we also want to retain as well. Um, but that being said, I, I, I can see that in the black letter of the rule, because this is a new licensed profession and, it's, and they're being licensed to do something less than a lawyer, um, that w the disclosure that they are not a lawyer sh should probably be in the black letter um, and be included in anything that we deem advertisements. Um, it may be difficult to some, in some instances to define what exactly is an advertisement, but, um, but I think it seems like in other areas, we're saying that as well with the written agreements that they are making these disclosures, including their license number. Um, I would say also maybe contact information. Um, that's right. something I think that we, uh, the rules right now talk about at, address and I think one of the things that we're, we're talking about changing is making it more general contact information because sometimes it can be accomplished through an email address or something like that for the person who's responsible for the communication but in, in general I think that's the right approach I just want to make sure that that you you all were aware that there there was this other effort just starting um, that may end up changing our work later but um, that said it might be helpful if Randy, if we go through some of the changes that you're proposing, and because we have Randy and Andrew here, they might be able to give probably <laughs> a better and deeper background on why certain things are the way they are in the rules than, than I can through my recollection, so. Yeah, especially the difference between advertising and solicitation on some of these, it, it's a little tricky. Yeah. And just to repeat, the other effort being the justice gap people, that's yeah, closing the basic. justice gap. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just to shorten it. Okay, yeah. got it. Got it. Okay. So do you want to do you want to start at the top? I, I thought we definitely would want to look at 7.6 and then um 
you had a question, Amos, around this section here, prepaid or group legal service plan. I just, I kind of want to understand in lay terms, the real time electronic contact, what that covers and doesn't cover. But do you want to start at the top, Greg? Sure. I, I mean, we can. Uh, 7.1, I, I, it seems that the, the changes that you're envisioning here, the only thing that I would um, may require some conversation here is whether or not, uh, one, do we want a, a board to have the authority to adopt standards? And two, should it be the board of trustees or the new paraprofessional board? Um, normally, I think in these circumstances, we do have the board of trustees as the sort of final arbiter on what standards get adopted and which ones don't. Perhaps maybe they could be recommended by the paraprofessional board to the board of trustees. Um, but we may, we may want to have, and Randy and Andrew, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on this, but we may want to have the board of trustees be the final decider um, on these types of standards, which can affect, uh, you know, discipline and whether or not somebody has to, can retain their license and continue to practice if they violate certain standards because they have a presumption against them. They engage in certain kinds of advertising that goes against a standard. Um, and whether there's maybe even some antitrust considerations there. Is the paraprofessional board, that phrase in B, are they the licensing board or just a disciplinary board? Well, right now they're contemplated as being both. Um, okay. Yeah. So they would be separate and apart from the, the state bar would not be licensing the paraprofessionals. They would not be uh, no, it, giving them the stamp of approval. The bar. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm open to uh, being persuaded otherwise, but my gut reaction is I think I would recommend retaining that the board of trustees be the one to formulate and adopt the standards. The main reason being uh, these should probably go out for public comment. And I just don't know if the paraprofessional board uh, can authorize things for public comment. Um, they very well may be able to, but let's assume that they can't. Uh, the board of trustees certainly has that authority and the staff and are able to process that. And then also, although it doesn't fit squarely, um, is the statutory authority for approving rules under the Business and Professions Code, at least for lawyers, is uh, under 6076 uh, and 6077 of the Business and Professions Code. And I, again, it's not an e easy, easy fit here because that says the board must uh, adopt a rule to be submitted to the Supreme Court for approval. And that's not what's occurring here, but, um, in my view, I think the spirit of that process uh, would be attained if you had the, the State Bar uh, Board of Trustees approve these standards, which they do otherwise for the uh, right for attorney standards. So I think this is getting at a bigger issue. Um, you'll recall, Greg, I think at our last meeting, that was the first time we've even taken up the discussion about what the governance, the overall governance structure is going to be for the program mm -hmm. and what, you know, who's going to appoint the members of the paraprofessional board and what they are and go, are, are not going to have authority to do. So I think if in general there would be, you know, this recommendation obviously would have implications beyond the advertising rules, right? The recommendation would be the board is still ultimately responsible for the rules for the program with the, the board of trustees versus the paraprofessional board, which um, seems consistent with other state bar boards and committees, frankly. Right. Yeah, it would be consistent. The, 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 the rules of professional conduct would be approved by the court, but in terms of these standards, the, the court is essentially in this provision delegating authority to either the paraprofessional board or the board of trustees, the authority to adopt the standards, which can affect discipline and the right to practice. And so, yes, I think consistent with, with other um, programs within the state bar, usually the buck stops with the board of trustees on this kind of matter. Yeah, and I think there was a prior discussion. I think it was just really preliminary. And this might be what you're referring to, Leah, is some need to have the discussion of what is delegated 
So, so if, if the paraprofessionals board is going to be uh, under the umbrella or a sub organization or whatever the term is for, uh, you know, boards that report to, or ultimately that the board of trustees supervises and oversees, there probably needs to be a very clear uh, delineation of what is delegated to the paraprofessionals board. And this seems like it would fit right into that discussion. I don't have a strong feeling either way. In fact, hearing, hearing this background about the advertising rules and how they might be amended and this exception for the board, it, it seems like the, the board of trustees might be the be better place. Even if we could, you know, if, if we could choose, it sounds like there may be reasons why we are sort of obligated to choose that. Mm -hmm. And it may be in practice, I mean, I, and this could be accomplished through state bar rules, aside from the rules of professional conduct that, that the paraprofessional board has the role of, of recommending changes to the standards, the advertising standards that the board of trustees can consider. And that would just be a formalized process through state bar rules rather than in the rules of professional conduct. Okay, should we keep going? Yeah, let's keep going. Um, it, I think the next big issue would be the legal services plan. You know, I don't know what the answer to this is. I know in terms of qualified referral services, we have talked about in different contexts, I think in this group, as well as some other groups that there, there's a seems to be general consensus that there should be some sort of formalized certification of referral services for paraprofessionals. But in, in terms of legal services plans, I, I, this would be a carve out for, um, as an exception for receiving value for recommending or securing services. Um, and I mean, I, it, this is, we can, we can decide, I think, for ourselves whether or not we want to allow this carve out. I'm not sure it's really going to be up to these legal services plans whether or not they want to include paraprofessionals in their, in, in the services that they offer to their members. But, um, and I imagine they would, I would have to say. Mm -hmm. So these legal services plans are not the Avos and the Rocket Lawyers. No, right? I think we're, I mean, we're offered here as, as, as state employees, I think we have. We're like offered. employee assistance type of legal services yeah. plans. Right. Where you pay a flat fee or something, and then you get free consultation, then some special low rate to hire them. Is that what it is? I believe so. Does anyone know? But I've never actually participated in one of these plans. Yeah, I think you pay like a monthly premium and then you have access to a benefit of up to some dollar amount. So the, the way the attorneys are, are allowed to be on those um, lists is sort of like the lawyer referral service, right? You meet certain qualifications, you must have malpractice insurance, right? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that they require malpractice insurance if they don't offer it through the planet as well. But um, I mean, we could get try to gather more information about what is required for lawyers to participate in these plans. Uh, I think it's typically there might be many variations, but I think typically my understanding is the most common example. And I don't know how a lawyer pays to be a part of this, but um, you know when you have insurance, for example. So you get in a car accident, maybe your insurance company will provide you some sort of legal representation. Um, I think that's an example of uh, a legal services plan, a, a very simple one. There might be more sophisticated ones. And again, I don't know in that example how, um, why it wouldn't be state farms and house lawyers who help you, um, but they might be uh, other attorneys um, or, or other arrangements in which someone pays a charge to be a panel member, uh, conflict counsel, or something like that um, mm -hmm. through through a insurance plan. And there may be other employment, uh, as you guys mentioned, some sort of union um, type arrangements where people can buy in and and have these type of representations. I'm not sure how how common they are. Mm -hmm. um, so. I Sorry to cut to the chase on this one, but my comment really, I just assumed for a, a qualified lawyer reserval, re, referral service that I don't think there's any 
ethical problem with allowing paraprofessionals to participate in that. Um, and I think the same would be, again, it is up to the service plans to decide if they want paraprofessionals, but I don't know why there would be any ethical problem with, again, in the context of this, this is an exception that allows for payment of fees <laughs> as, as an advertisement effectively, right? And if, if they're allowed to be part of a legal services plan, if we don't have any prohibition on that, and they decide private contract wise to do that, I assume that's not an ethical issue. The question is why wouldn't we allow for this as, as a form of advertisement, right? Well, let me just mention a little bit of background mm -hmm. um, because I do think if you delve into the history of this, you might reach the conclusion that there is something, I don't wanna call it a regulatory hole or gap, but first and foremost on the certified lawyer referral services, that is actually another aspect of the charter to the closing the justice gap working group. So the closing the justice gap working group has also been asked to take a look at the existing statutory and rules governing certified lawyer referral services, the minimum standards for lawyer referral services, and see if they are inhibiting or promoting access. And so in connection with looking at such things as online matching services on the one hand versus the traditional bar association LRS and seeing if the rules should be the same, should they be different, et cetera, the closing the justice gap working group could be asked the question of because the paraprofessional program seems to be a little bit ahead down the, the track than, than CPJG could be asked the question and, and look at specifically whether the LRS rules should be expanded to include uh, a referral, not just the, for a lawyer, but also a paraprofessional who's authorized to engage in a limited practice of law activity. Um, likely in areas that the service either already has lawyer panels or would be benefited from adding a, a panel. And right. so on the lawyer referral service side, I think there is a, a mechanism in place for that uh, reform, that change to be, to be examined. On the so-called legal services plan. So that, that could be a group prepaid or plans of legal insurance, as I understand it historically. And the reference to plans of legal insurance, you know, maybe that's where I'm thinking, if you dig back, you might find something of a regulatory gap. Um, the State Department of Insurance has said a, a plan of legal insurance is not governed by them because it's not truly insurance. It's, it's more of a, a prepaid uh, benefit. Um, uh, prepaid legal services plans and uh, other uh, similar plans aren't purely referral service activity because they're actually providing a legal service. You get access to uh, a letter written on your behalf. You get access to a call placed to somebody on your behalf. Um, uh, you get to do a uh, inter vivos uh, living trust and you you pay for these things and you get access to them. And when uh, the attorney advertising rules were originally conceived uh, after Bates versus State Bar of Arizona, they were extremely detailed. They, they, they tried to regulate everything under the sun for fear that the new commercial speech protection for lawyer advertising would result in a wild west out there in terms of lawyer marketing. And the, the original uh, rules of professional conduct addressing uh, group prepaid uh, plans of legal insurance were very detailed. Um, the, the approach that's taken now assumes that the lawyers who participate are also governed by all of their other professional responsibilities. And so if you're allowed to pay the usual charges, quote unquote, of a legal service plan, you have to take that in the context of, don't take that sort of as an insular or piecemeal aspect of a, of a duty. You have to take that in connection with 5.4 and the obligation never to let your professional independent judgment be impaired, not to have a, a, an arrangement, financial arrangement that constitutes what would be an illegal fee split 
for example, paying percentages for actual cases or taking part of, of the fee uh, that the lawyer receives, uh, uh, contracting for those things in advance. And so pay the usual charges of a legal service plan does contemplate uh, other duties on the, on the lawyer, or in this case, the paraprofessional. So if the paraprofessional will also be regulated by provisions similar to an unconscionable fee prohibition, a fee split prohibition, a professional independent judgment protection, then including this in the advertising, because it is just one part of a whole, makes sense because the paraprofessional's regulation would be comparable to how the lawyer is regulated. Um, still, there is this concept of a possible regulatory hole between you know, what's considered an insurance coverage and what is considered a prepaid legal plan. The industry has, has some self-regulation though. The American Prepaid Institute is a very, last time I looked, a very uh, well uh, sort of established uh, uh, stakeholder in the arena of prepaid legal services. And they do uh, establish internal self-regulatory standards for uh, prepaid legal service plans that facilitate the lawyer's compliance with their other professional obligations. Um, so, I don't know if the American Prepaid Institute has to be brought on board with the idea of prepaid services for power professionals, but um, I think you see where I'm going. If, if the big picture parallels lawyers, I think the small issue of this aspect of 7.2 uh, would be fine. And I think that is the intent, right? Parallel lawyers, pretty much. Yeah, we- I have a slightly different question though. The, the, the um, addressing the LRS rules, that is where this whole question of can um, the matching services like uh, like I keep bringing up Avo or Rocket Lore, are they going to now be authorized, right? That's going to be taken up in that um, reassessment of the LRS rules, right? So if we adopt 7.2 as it is now, um, paraprofessionals would be precluded from using any of those kinds of advertising platforms. Certified Sorry. lawyer referral services until the scope of the lawyer referral service regulation is, is affirmatively expanded to encompass that. I think that's correct. Right. Well, I, I, I would answer it slightly different because Leah, to your point, if the paraprofessionals uh, working group uh, approve this rule and mm -hmm. the Supreme Court adopts it, assuming that's the process, the 7.2 B2 is going to permit a paraprofessional to uh, be referred through a qualified legal referral service. That won't work until you have changes to both the state bar rules and um, the statute. And the rules so, of um, What do you I mean? That's what, what Leo what was what saying. Won't, what won't work? <laughs> so, a paraprofessional won't be able to be referred uh, a client through a qualified legal referral service, notwithstanding this rule of professional conduct for paraprofessional being adopted until those other um, statutes and state bar rules are, are amended to permit them to participate in those programs. No, that's fine. But even when they're permitted to do so under the current construct, it's still going to preclude the kind of matching service, like a modern matching service that is not a certified lawyer or referral service under the current definition, right? Correct. I mean, the rules won't address that issue. So. No, I, I know. I guess yeah. what I just want to raise is that I personally think that limitation on advertising is really um, restrictive in the modern era. You, you, I, I know Randy and Andrew heard me talk about this before. I, I think we need to allow for matching services and that's the way most people, um, you know, the common person is gonna go about trying to find a, a service provider. So I guess I just feel like we're missing an opportunity to address it here ahead of the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group because that's two years away at least. But so again, I yeah. don't know that you could solve that problem here. I I, I don't no, necessarily I'm disagree just with you. The recommendation. I'm not saying we could solve it, but we could we could push it a little bit. Because even yeah, sorry, go ahead, Amos. I was going to say 
I think the way matching services typically would work is also a fee, right? So there's going to be a fee issue um, with it as well, um, in addition, just an advertising issue, um, which I, I think is the bigger issue when the other working group deals with lawyer referral services uh, and tries to expand that to matching beyond the lawyer referral service, because there is a specific provision that allows for the, the uh, basically the referral fees, right? LRS is generally, I think, collect a portion of the fees. Um, and there's going to need to be some method for these matching programs to exist and get paid, I assume. So I don't know that we are able that, I don't think that would be within this advertising rule. It would have, or, or, or again, the implications I think would be much more about the, the fee sharing and fee splitting issues. Maybe you could change the minimum standards in compliance with the statute to allow, to Leah's point, easier ways for matching services and whomever else to pair clients with lawyers, you would be in compliance with 7.2 B2 and you wouldn't have to change That's any right. language of this rule. And the same would be true for paraprofessionals. Um, so to shortcut this, as long as we're comfortable with legal services plans, which I think is the trickier question, um, my recommendation, I think Randy's is the same, keep the language as it is with the hope that both the statute and the rules will be uh, edited, amended broadly to allow for more uh, matching of lawyers and also paraprofessionals because LRSs uh, are obligated on the statute to enhance access uh, to folks of limited and modest means and paraprofessionals could be a great vehicle for that if the services they provide are at a lower rate. Absolutely. I assume you guys will decide if, you, if this needs a asterisk or a comment that says not currently permitted by the rules or, or something of that because it, there, again, it's, it's a little bit odd to allow for that payment as an advertisement when under the underlying premise is it's, it's not currently allowed. Should we okay. add then matching services to the language? It's, it's not, it's a proposal anyway. Well, they're not currently permitted. So what goes first, the horse the or the cart? <laughs> right. I think the idea would be if, if the closing the justice gap working group Amends this amends the rules to allow for matching and amends the rules to change advertising. That you know there would also need to be a look to see if it's appropriate to have a parallel change for the paraprofessionals. Absolutely, I think that's totally correct, and that's also in line with if the advertising rules are streamlined or further edited. So there could very well be a situation where the paraprofessional rules are approved and or adopted, and you know almost shortly thereafter, within a year. Uh, cleanup revisions have to take place, mm -hmm. right? And we, we can do that. We're you're, we're used to that. Yeah, we all <laughs> all of our discussions about cart or the horse, which one? <laughs> but we've elected to take the more progressive approach and best practice approach. Uh, I think in most of our activities. So this next change in C, I think, is the, the main one, uh, the substantive one. I guess there, there's others we'll discuss. But this is where I thought, uh, and I guess there's a parallel one for advertisements and solicitation, but just some indication, some clear indication that the paraprofessional is not an attorney and then you know the, the name and license number. I, I think, Greg, you commented that this address maybe should be contact information. I don't know if that's something we should get ahead of the, law, the, the other one on or not, but I don't have any problem with that. So can I provide a, a counter argument here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of streamlining and, and less regulation, uh, I can read the room, so this might not uh, be agreed, but I would advocate for adding this to a, as a comment to rule 7.1. So I think um, it would be false or misleading uh, to imply or infer that you are a lawyer. Um, and you can even build upon that uh, for paraprofessionals that you are able to provide legal services in an area outside um, 
you know, whatever practice area you are uh, approved or licensed or certified, whatever the language is for paraprofessionals uh, to, to offer. And a way to do that would be to model the language after current comment two to rule 7.1. And this isn't perfect, but you know, a communication that states or implies that a paraprofessional is a lawyer or is able to provide legal services outside the scope that they are authorized uh, to provide services is a false or misleading communication under this rule. And then you don't bear down um, or over, overburden um, the ability to advertise uh, within the rules. And the, ad, the argument in favor of that, it might not be persuasive is it's just easier to advertise your services if you don't have to hang all these ornaments on it. Like, here's my number. By the way, I'm not a lawyer. You know, it's easier, uh, whether it's via Twitter or whatever, you know, whatever uh, social media or electronic means um, to advertise to allow persons to be more nimble in how they uh, advertise their services. Of course, I understand and respect the need to protect the public, but I I'll just put it out there as the counter argument. It might not uh, win the day here, but I, I think that this concern can be achieved. And also there's another reference, I think uh, within another rule for similar concept uh, can really be achieved under the construct of 7.1, which again is the emanating principle uh, governing all advertising and solicitation. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think this, desire to have an affirmative representation is based on the concern about false and misleading statements. So I do think that's another way to approach it, but it would have a vastly different uh, you know, result in, in the marketplace, right? So uh, regulation of false and misleading statements is a very difficult thing to do. So it really undermines the ability to monitor and enforce um, and you know, it's hard to see how an advertisement for a paraprofessional providing legal services um, for a new licensed professional, it's not attorney, isn't going to be misleading if it doesn't have the affirmative clarification, right? Because people aren't familiar with what paraprofessionals are. So right. if you need legal assistance in your family law case, call us at this number we're experts, we know what we're doing. And the idea is we, we need to do something in terms of public protection and regulation to avoid that obvious issue. We could also as, work on, oh, sorry, who was talking? I didn't mean to uh, that, that was me, I, I cut you off. I, yeah, I, that's okay, okay. I just, just um, was gonna say, we could also work on the name of these, the title of these new, Professional licensed professionals, because paraprofessional doesn't mean anything to the average consumer, right? So somehow we make the title more descriptive. Like I came up with some ideas all by myself. I brainstormed by myself. Like for example, just putting it out there. Don't don't laugh. Is like for non-attorney legal representative (NLR). You know something that in the title is really obvious. They're not attorneys. That way we, you know, I I I take your point that. You want to help them be nimble. I totally get that, especially with platforms like Twitter. I don't use it myself, but I know they have a word count. So, um, so if we make the name, the title for this professional is really descriptive, then it would it perhaps eliminate the need to have to make them say things like, I'm not a lawyer. Did I tell you I'm not a lawyer? <laughs> I can help you, but I'm not a lawyer. I totally agree with that. Uh, I, I'm a big advocate that we shouldn't leave it as paraprofessionals and we should have some name to that. But again, unless there's a requirement that they use that name in their advertisement, um, you fall into the same concern, right? If, if it was called non-attorney something, then you could kill two birds with one stone, but it's unlikely. Oh, well, I, I don't know yet that we're going to come to agreement about that. Uh, so my last... Go ahead, Sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say my, my, my last pitch on, on this. I, I understand um, the concerns uh, you're, you're both raising. Um, you know, with LDA, I think you mentioned the same as at the beginning LDAs, UDAs, and immigration consultants, uh, the statute requires that they 
uh, disclose that they're not a lawyer at the time of engagement. Right. And maybe if there's a, um, you know, operative statute or rule of court for this program, that might be the better place to house the affirmative statement when you engage the person and not um, um, over-regulate the advertising of, um, of, of the services. But so can anyway. I ask you about that? Because I think I'm totally open to where this provision goes, whether it's a rule of court or the rules of professional conduct. And I understand that's something that we're gonna discuss more on some of the other rules about where, where they should live. But how would that be different? If there was a rule of court, for example, that said, you know, you have to say you're not an attorney in advertisement, how would that be different than putting it in the specific rules of professional conduct dealing with advertisements? Well, it would, it would be different in terms of where and how the requirement need to be effectuated. So the requirement doesn't, in this example, does not have to be effectuated in the advertisement. And the other example has to be effectuated in the agree, um, retention agreement uh, or whatever you want to, whatever you want to call I see it. see what you're saying. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, no, I think. Now yeah. what's, what's the remedy uh, is another question and uh Greg and, and Randy might have, have thoughts on that. Is it discipline? Is it voiding the contract? You know, that's something um, uh, to think about. But I, I think if you include this concept in a comment, um, as I was advocating, because I do think it's an important point, I think you would still have the ability to discipline a paraprofessional who, who violated the concept of a false or misleading statement by implying they are something they're not or able to do something they're not. I just, anyway, I don't want to, belabor the point, I know time is sensitive, um, just because there's a general consensus on, on streamlining um, these rules generally, um, I just wanna make the pitch that I think there's a way uh, to do this without hanging additional ornaments on, on the advertising rules. But um, you know, if others, if the majority does not agree, I, I totally get that. Well, can I, I'll just say that this is one area and I, as I, after our last meeting, I went through and, and revised the whole set of rules again, based on some of the, the, um, the decisions we made, the policy decisions we made in the last meeting. And one that is reverberating through almost every rule at this point is the decision to allow paraprofessionals and lawyers to combine into single firms. And so, I, and that has an implication here as well, because I'm just wondering how a firm that includes both lawyers and not and paraprofessionals or whatever we're going to call them, how they comply with this rule, um, because most of them are not advertising particular attorneys within. I mean, there's there's obviously different there there's exceptions to that, but uh, most firms will probably be advertising their firm and the services their firm provides, rather than the types of professionals that are going to be providing those services. And I'm not sure how those types of firms would comply with this rule as written. It, it's clear that it's it, it's intended, it seems, for somebody who's either a, a solo paraprofessional or a firm of paraprofessionals who may be offering legal services. So can I ask in that comment, is it your assumption then that if they combine, and I agree this is the harder case through a number of different rules, but if there's a combined firm between lawyers and paraprofessionals, that the lawyers would not be supervising the paraprofessionals as they do for all, because, because there's specific rules on this, right? So I think we'd, I think if there's a firm that has attorneys and non-attorneys in it, I don't think that creates a problem with these advertising rules, given that the attorneys have to supervise, right? So if it's the firm that's advertising and not an individual attorney or paraprofessional, I don't think that raises a concern here. I think it would only be if we created the situation where paraprofessionals combine with attorneys in a firm but are not supervised and there's some advertisement by the paraprofessionals in the firm <laughs> that doesn't apply to the attorneys. I think that's a hard sort of to think that through. Um, we're lawyers so we can sort of figure out but I, I think this the, the concept would be this doesn't change a law firm's ability to advertise as a law firm. Um, I, don't, I don't think that um, the idea is that paraprofessionals and lawyers in a firm together uh, 
necessitates the paraprofessional to be supervised by the lawyer. No, yeah, because we we talked about actually paraprofessionals being partners in some of these firms as well. So um, it may be that I mean we may have a we'll probably have a rule that a paraprofessional can't supervise a lawyer, but I, I can't I can imagine a firm in which the the org chart looks like this, you know, you have lawyers and paraprofessionals on the top tier and the top paraprofessional supervises the other paraprofessionals in the firm. Right, so that is complicated and we have to work through those rules, but how does that, what I'm trying to figure out is how does that cause a problem with these advertising rules? I'm not well, sure. Well, this particular provision is what I'm saying. So if, 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 if it's just a firm that includes both paraprofessionals and lawyers, we are requiring a name and address for at least one lawyer or para, uh, licensed paraprofessional. And the third statement, include a, in the communication a clear and conspicuous statements that the licensed paraprofessional is not a lawyer. Is that only if the person who's listed is a paraprofessional? So for instance, if you have a firm that includes both per, perfe, licensed professions and you list a lawyer as the person responsible, do we, is there, are we saying that there needs to be some statement? Yes, this firm also includes paraprofessionals who are not lawyers. But only if they're, ad, they're using that as part of their advertisement, like, you know, to market their services, inform the public that, you know, for example, a family law firm, you know, we have both attorneys and this new, whatever we call them, paraprofessionals as a selling point. I don't see that if they, don't advertise the services of the paraprofessional in their firm, why they would have to comply with this rule. Yeah, and that's why I, 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 with that way of thinking, it's, I'm starting to lean towards Andrew's suggestion of making it a comment because to the extent that you are going to, you're going to uh, out yourself that you have paraprofessionals working there and you don't say that they are not lawyers, um, I guess that would, you know, could potentially violate Rule 7.1, but this, this is one of the reasons I think the general trend has been to go away from trying to regulate particular types of communications because it gets mm -hmm. it gets pretty gnarly pretty quickly. Um, it, it seems easy, the most readily applicable to like the solo practitioner, right? Because the state bar doesn't regulate organizations or law firms. So like I just pull up a law firm website there's nothing on here telling me, really nothing even saying this is a law firm. You know, it's just, so I, I like the advertising rules right now don't apply to law firms. Right. So I, I'm just trying to also, so, uh, you know, we've already talked about in another session about disclosures and the written contract and all that which will include this information. And I'm just trying to think about the evil we're trying to prevent with this provision. Are, are we saying, uh, Amos, are, we, are you saying that if they don't identify themselves as non-attorneys, that the client, the person who calls them is, you know, is persuaded to call them for services will continue to think they're not attorneys, even though we're requiring that in the contract, there would be that comment. So when they're talking to the person, they can't, you know, kind of um, pretend they're attorneys or project their attorneys. And then when they actually sign for services, they're signing these disclosures and all that, that should makes it clear they're not attorneys. No, so this is actually a very good point that I think it's worth clarifying because I think the way false or misleading advertisement law works, it doesn't necessarily matter that you later clarify that your earlier advertisement was false. That doesn't absolve you from making false or misleading advertisements. So it might be that, yeah, you advertise with misleading or false statements. They come to your office, you sign the documents and you know, right before they sign the last documents, they, you know, by the way, I'm not an attorney. That does, that does not or should not mean that you can advertise whatever you want, including false statements, if you later have some disclosure. So I, I think it's a, an important point because the, the advertising limitations is separate and apart from the 
written contract requirement or, or informed consent requirements. We could decide to change one or both, but I think they're sort of independent regulations. I would think so too. And anyway, not, not to belabor this point, but if the paraprofessional we assume uh, is astute with their rules of professional conduct, I think uh, the communication rule uh, 1.4A4 um, would also be applicable and would expose the paraprofessional potentially to discipline in the situation where uh, they fail to advise the client about any relevant limitation on the paraprofessional's conduct when the paraprofessional knows that the client expects assistance not permitted by the paraprofessional rules or, or other law. And so for an example where either the client is asking the paraprofessional to do something that the paraprofessional should know that they are limited from doing, or the paraprofessional is representing that they're able to do more than um, the um, licensure uh, permits them to do. Um, should they fail to communicate that, uh, exposes them to discipline? Uh, to, you know, when you know your client is being misled by how you're holding yourself out, uh, you need to uh, correct that misunderstanding uh, as soon as possible. And there are several um, provisions in the rules which would uh, allow for that that type of protection in, in my view. So I'm, I'm very interested in, as we go through these discussions about combined firms with lawyers and paraprofessionals, I think there's work to do on that <laughs> yeah. um, because it, it's a little bit complicated, but I am of the opinion that that should be encouraged. And, and I would like to see us draft the rules in such a way that that is possible. Uh, and that includes with advertising. So if, I'm not sure I fully follow the concern here about the, the combined firms, but I, you know, if it is a concern, I, I suggest that we address it to make it clear that we're not in any way hindering um, the ability to, to have a combined firm and advertise as a combined firm. And that might be a comment too, but, but I'm, I'm happy to try to work through that. I think my concern was just with number three, include a communication that clear and conspicuous statement that the license, it just seems like some, there are certain circumstances in which that may or may not be applicable or, you know, um, do, are, we, are we saying that if, I mean, maybe it's a way of drafting the rule. If we wanna remain consistent with the way the lawyer rule is now, you would just include a name or, and we could actually, instead of saying address, contact information and right. get the right. jump on the closing the justice gap group there. Yeah. Um, but at least one lawyer, comma, licensed paraprofessional, comma, or law firm responsible for its content. In one, C1. C1. Yeah, it's C1. I mean, I guess we could, we don't re currently require lawyers to provide their license numbers. Um, I suppose we could make something, have a, if it's a paraprofessional, they have to include their license number. I'm not sure why we would need to do that, but. So the ABA change, I believe, gets rid of address. Maybe you already mentioned this. I yeah, we were saying contact information. Exactly. Yeah, so I'd be, I'd definitely be open to that, uh, both the contact information point, but modifying this. So it, I think that what you're proposing, Greg, is to modify the rule to address the combination firm. So it's sort of either or. Um, right. uh, and or I think the law firm. We did the, or the law firm, right. The law firm itself. Right. Yeah, I would want to make sure we do think about the license number and the statement that they're not a lawyer. Because again, I think that's, those are the main changes. The other one I think was just to parallel the rules, but I think that the, that was already in the, that already in the current rule. I think the addition is a license number and statement that it's, that the paraprofessional is not a lawyer. So I'd want to make sure we include that in, in some appropriate way and not trip over ourselves with the combined firm situation. Because I think if it's a law firm that has attorneys, um, you know, I'm not sure what the advertisement concern there would be unless it's the paraprofessional advertising paraprofessional services, not supervised by an attorney. That's the only issue that when it would come up. 
If you, yeah, if you were, if you, if you want to recommend for the group to consider that it, it, to the extent the person identified as responsible for the advertisement as a paraprofessional, they must include their license number and a statement stating, you know, that they are not a lawyer. That I, that would I would draft that differently because I. So that it's not one, two, three. It's a new statement to the extent that the person identified is a licensed paraprofessional, then they need to include their number and their and a statement that they're not a lawyer. So I'm fine with that if there's one rule that's combined for attorneys and paraprofessionals. But my understanding is this is a we're drafting a paraprofessional rule. So I think the assumption should be the opposite. Like include it, except if you're you know, as a combined with a, a, a firm or a lawyer and they're providing their information, right? Yeah, this is one of those many rules that I have notes throughout now that we were, gonna, we're probably gonna have conforming changes needed for the lawyer rules. Um, because once we make that decision to combine paraprofessionals and lawyers, mm -hmm. all the conflict imputation rules need to change on the lawyer side too. And okay, fair enough. Yeah, if it's a combined rule, then I, def I, I totally agree with you. And did you say uh, attorneys right now don't have to um, state their license number? It's not part of the current rule. It's not no. part of the current rule. And from a consumer protection standpoint, we want to include it here as proof that they're licensed or as a way to locate them on some website. I mean, right now you could search for an attorney's license number on CalBar. By name. Yeah, that was my question to Amos. I, I didn't un understand because lawyers are not required to use their license number. So I, I think he th wants to include that as an added protection. Right. right but if there's a for California licensed professionals, I think it's right. But if the person can search, not that people know to do that. People don't know to do that for lawyers either. But if there is a way to search their name and find their license number that way, as long as their name is correct. Yeah, I'm hopeful. I don't know if we need to write regulations about this, but I'm hopeful that the state bar would have, you know, public information about the licensee and complaints or discipline and bonds and have that all very easily available on the state bar websites for those consumers who want to search, are able to or want to search the, the state bar's website. So, so this issue is, you know, the, the advertisement. And, and again, I think it's a fairly common, I think it depends where you start from in, in consumer protection, right? I think, I think a bond requirement and requiring people to not falsely advertise and requiring people to have and state what their license number is are pretty basic common consumer protections. And yes, that'll enable people to both confirm their license as well as you know, find information about them. And there are some other professionals that have to declare their license number in their advertising. Absolutely. Yeah, I seem to recall hearing at the end of a commercial, license number, blue. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm not exactly sure where we are with this one. Um, one, we're changing to contact information, right? And we are adding um, lawyer. So it's of at least one paraprofessional lawyer or firm responsible for its content, right? Two, including the, at least one paraprofessional license number is two dependent on whether one is a paraprofessional? Meaning, if I'm if, if if a lawyer is responsible for the content, then why does he or she have to include the paraprofessional's number? Or if the law firm is responsible for the content? Yeah, I'm struggling with the whole firm thing since we don't regulate firms. No, but we're regulating the, the person who's placing the advertisement. So. Yeah, but, and that person could be like the the communications director, who's not even a lawyer, right? In a law firm. Right, but the lawyer has a duty to supervise non-lawyer assistance, mm -hmm. and if that person's violating the advertising rules, it would be the general, you know, someone at the law firm would need to be responsible, would need to be responsible whether it's who identifying that person is could be a challenge, Leah, especially in larger firms, but um, 
Okay. Those are definitely like this special. right now. <laughs> huh? You guys have a case like this right now on this very provision that we're dealing with. So it does come but, up. But, yeah. the, but that, but that uh, Andrew, that was a, the rule that I was referring to. And sorry, I didn't do it by number, but that that's the rule I was referring to. You know, if there's a combined firm with lawyers and paraprofessionals, wouldn't yep. that rule, unless we change it, require the attorney to make sure all the rules of professional conduct, including advertising, are followed and, and therefore the attorneys subject to discipline as well? Unless we change the rule. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I also think part of this can be, uh, in my view, we're looking at 7.2. So 7.2 begins with subsection A and that dictates who is making the advertisement. So if I look at the lawyer rules, subject to the requirements of 7.1 and 7.3, again, can't be false or misleading, everything leads back to 7.1. A lawyer may advertise for services through any written, recorded, electronic means of communication, including public media. A lawyer shall, looking at B, um, and so I think the lawyer would be obligated um, to, um, include their contact information or whatever amendments we're gonna make. And then conversely, the analysis would be, is this a paraprofessional who's doing the advertising? Then they are the ones uh, to whom the rule is gonna be applied when you're looking at that type of advertisement. So long way of winding up to say, if a law firm is, in my view, if a law firm is advertising and we have paralegals and paraprofessionals uh, and whomever else, um, and it's the law firm that's advertising, I would argue that the rule of professional conduct 7.2 is the governing rule that you would apply to the lawyer for that advertisement. I agree. And if that is the right analysis, I don't think we should be making these changes because I don't think the combination of firms, I think it confuses it more by adding lawyer into um, into the paraprofessional version if it's a separate rule for 7.2 C because well, I it, think yeah because I think specifically because 7.2 a makes it clear that this is only regulating when the paraprofessional is doing the advertising uh, that, that's my read I think Greg might have of a, of a different view but because we're adding these new provisions two and three I think um, I don't want to speak for Greg, but he's trying to protect those firms that are advertising that include the paraprofessional to make sure that those additional obligations are not required. Um, right. So if we go back think, to sticking this into a comment, we might uh, <laughs> address all of this, but I, I digress. <laughs> okay, in the interest of time, should we just flag this one as something we need to come back to? Yeah. All right. I think that makes sense. Solicitation of clients. Looks like Amos, you had a question about C. Yeah, but I think this goes back to a more fundamental question of the difference between a solicitation and an advertisement is what how I read it. And do websites count for either? Yes. Advertisement? Yes. The so websites count as advertisement, not as solicitation, right? Correct. Any advertisement is any medium, media, whatever the right way of uh, the plural. Um, solicit I view solicitation as a direct communication whether mm -hmm. written or in person, I'm soliciting you specifically. And um, that, that's how I, that's how I view the, the difference. So, uh, so my question here in this comment for 7.3 C is every written recorded or electronic communication from a paraprofessional soliciting professional employment. What's the reason for this limitation from any person known to be in need of legal services in a particular matter. Okay, so historically there was this concept of 
uh, blast advertising by mail versus targeted mail advertising by mail. And the history of the evolution of the, the advertising solicitation rules took on this concept that um, the targeted mail advertisement is more akin to uh, a solicitation uh, because it has some of the attributes where a lawyer's trained art of persuasion might mislead or overbear the free will of the consumer. And so if I go to a police blotter uh, for Friday night and I find out everybody who is picked up for, for DUI and on Monday morning, there's a targeted mail solicitation in, in their mailbox or maybe in their email you know, box, but it has details about when they were arrested, what the the matter was, um, and maybe the lawyer was even able to look up if this is their first or second, if it's a matter of public record, then that consumer might think, wow, this lawyer knows all of this. Um, and they're saying they can, you know, possibly, you know, solve this problem without jail time. Um, I should probably hire them as opposed to the the person who is on the billboard or, or is generally advertising. Right. And so this concept of from a person known to be need of legal services in a particular matter, to me is a remnant of that concept when we're trying to s distinguish between uh, direct contact marketing versus general public media marketing. And right. an aspect of direct market is that uh, the lawyer or the advertiser has found a way to, to show or dazzle the potential consumer that I know something. And that means you might want to hire me. So my, my feeling is, again, unless we're trying to get ahead of ourselves, we should be paralleling the attorney regulations and, and applying them to paraprofessionals. So, you know, I think that's, that's, should be our starting point, but but again, reading these rules of anew, I, I thought it would be fine to delete this, <laughs> and 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 uh, you know would have the intended uh, you know regulation, but but I don't I think we should parallel what what the rules are for attorneys and see if the other working group streamlines them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree, and to me, it's, uh, I look at uh, solicitation advertising as active versus passive, so active targeted advertising, you know, looking up information and all that, and versus this passive advertising, hey, hire me in general. So I would agree with Ames on that. Except of course, two and three, I think it's the same discussion we had up above, so. It's exactly the same, um, maybe more important in solicitation advertising. Again, I'm not sure I'm convinced I really appreciate the difference, but if, if the concern is direct advertising and solicitation is of more concern, um, it might be more important to have these clarifications. But again, I think the, the reason for having these really goes back to the false and misleading. So it really should all be captured in that. And it's just a, hey, we're creating a new licensed professional that's not an attorney that people won't be familiar with. When you're going to, if you're going to be advertising your legal services, you should clarify, you should clarify you're not an attorney is, I think the, the same idea. One over the top example that's happening right now, that's happened, happened for a long time is that on our public record on our website, you can find out what cases, brand new divorce cases have been opened and their SRL, self-represented litigants and paralegals or LDAs, reach out to them and say, we can help you finish your case. So I'm hoping that that's a solicitation, <laughs> consider solicitation later on under these rules. Gosh, I just totally see the counter argument like that's kind of convenient. <laughs> so, but it is anyway. if you know what you're doing and it isn't. If they're not, they're not yeah, if you're vulnerable, but everybody's not vulnerable. So yeah, I guess it's, it's not thing. prohibited. You can do it. You just can't do it in a false or misleading or overbearing manner. So you got to be truthful uh, in doing it. But I, these rules don't prohibit solicitation or advertising. 
The, the other reason um, when you know someone is, uh, well, in Fariba's example, an active litigant or someone who might have a claim um, to put advertisement on the outside is um, there was anecdotal evidence of uh, clients being made upset uh, or concerned when they get mail from the law office of you know Joe Smith. They, are, they might think there's some um, exposure or requirement uh, for them to appear or respond. And so the concept of um, putting uh, the recipient at ease with the disclaimer of average, I'm not saying that this is right or wrong, but I think that's part of the historical reason for, for that provision in the rules. Okay, I'm just conscious of the time now. I think this, the rest of this, including D, we've already addressed, is that right? Yeah, I think so too. Yes. Should we move on to 7.4? Yeah, I was looking through. Is there anything of issue in 7.4? Well, I, I think 7.4 we, we probably would want. I don't know if a paraprofessional would be a certified specialist. So mm -hmm. I think we would probably want to maybe use this rule to say they must communicate, um, should, should not state that they're um, licensed to practice in a particular field of law unless they they are <laughs> licensed to protect. But that, this again gets back to, you know, whether or not this is all covered by 7.1. Right. Um, and I think that's what B does. I think um, that's what I tried to change B into. I see. Yeah, I, I don't know though if do we don't need A because there is no such no. thing as a certified specialist for a paraprofessional. I don't know what we're calling. We're we're I think the system that or the model we have devised so far is that they have to pick a specialty and get right. They get like family law, for example. So do do we want them to declare that their specialty, the area that they can practice in? Maybe they pick family law and UDs, for example, or family law and violence prevention. Is that what we want to do here, that they have to declare? Um, here, in, it doesn't, it's not an affirmative. No, um, it's, a, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's prohibitive. So not compelled speech. To, to, to make it affirmative, would, I mean, it would make it very vague as to when you have to communicate. Anytime you use the word, I am a paraprofessional, you have to include, <laughs> I, and I am only licensed to practice in this particular area. I think the prohibitive works in the sense that, you know, you, you can't say that you're, you're licensed to practice in an area that you're not. Um, that would clearly be false and misleading. Okay, so they don't have to say, I'm only licensed in the area of family law. They don't have, but they can't. I, can, I could see that. I could see it'll it'll achieve the same results. Mm -hmm. But A definitely doesn't belong here, yeah? I think we can get rid of A. I don't think there's gonna be certified specialists because they're... Um, and then in terms of C, I, we'll probably get rid of the cross-reference to B and turn that into B. Um, I'm just wondering, in the, especially in the area of family law, whether or not there'll be family law paraprofessionals who within that field will be specializing in certain things and whether or not we want to give them the ability to say, hey, you know, I know I'm certified in family law, which includes this whole panoply of, of different activity, authorized activities. But actually what I really do is I focus on child custody. Mm -hmm. um, like That's an a, area of concentration. Yeah. We actually haven't talked about that, but I kind of like that. Like subs because it's such a big like area. Yeah. It's a long list. I Greg, you've seen it, Leah, you've seen it. So maybe it's a good idea to talk about subspecialty, but at the same time makes this model more complicated, add more steps. And this statement is one of those, this, these are the kind of statements that led to a lot of discussion in the Rules Revision Commission, because it's permissive. It's not, it's not, it's basically providing guidance as to what you can do. 
um, without violating the rules. And, and, but wouldn't what you're saying be covered by this? I mean, wouldn't it be allowed by this? It, that wouldn't be violative of anything, would it? In a particular field of law, um, yeah, I. It's, the reason I'm struggling with this is because it's this is a rule written for lawyers who are omnicompetent, and and so um, I don't know the best way to write it, but I think what we we I think there's some agreement that they sh should be permitted to even within their licensure focus on particular activities without violating this rule. But do you mean that a I, I as a lawyer need a, or a paraprofessional need a rule that say I may tell somebody, hey, I, I don't do UDs, I only do family law? Is that what, what this says? Am I yeah, well, I think it's, what it's saying you, uh, you may communicate the fact that uh, you do not practice in a particular field of law. Well, for paraprofessionals, it depends on what we mean by particular field of law. So if what we're saying is a particular field of law means a different form of licensure that I don't right. have, not only may they say that they don't, they shouldn't say that they do. So, right. so, uh, what, so with, this, with this, the intention of this provision, and Randy, you can jump in if I'm wrong, but was intended to say is that it, you can say that you're, um, you limit your practice without having, uh, without it being misleading to somebody. So I, I think, yeah, it just provides the, the counterfactual that people are concerned with based on the initial limitation. So the initial limitation for public protection is to not say you're a certified specialist unless you're certified by um, the state bar or um, some other group designated by the state bar to certify you. There are special qualifications to achieve that status. Notwithstanding that general prohibition, you are able to say, I specialize in family law. You don't have to, but don't worry lawyer, if you say, you know, I limit my practice to legal ethics or immigration, you are not violating this rule so long as you don't say you're a certified specialist and you don't qualify, so. Yeah, it's especially to deal with these certified specialists, areas of specialization. Um, so that people can still practice in those areas without being a certified specialist and, and they can say that they limit their practice to those areas. Exactly. They just can't say that they're certified, you know, they don't have to get the imprimatur. Be's a, a safe harbor for those folks who might have been concerned that, oh, I can't say I'm specialized because I might be exposed to discipline under this rule. And they're saying, no, that's not the case. It's certified specialists that it's And it should go exposure. without saying that all of those representations about practice limited to experience and um, those would all have to be true. So, right. so back to 7.1. Mm -hmm. So are you suggesting, may I put words in your mouth? Are you suggesting, suggesting we might not even need a 7.4? That is what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm fine with that. I mean, I think I when think I read it- reserved for sure. Yeah, when I read through this, I thought I did see the parallel because there are areas of practice where paraprofessionals are going to be licensed and that's the limit of their allowed practice area. So it seems like we could do something parallel with that, but I agree it's not, it, it probably isn't necessary in the same way as it is for the certified specialist issue. Well, then we need uh, B because while lawyers don't they can be generalists. They don't have to choose a specialty to practice. Like I could do family law, I could do UD without having to get a special, you know, um, certification to do those. I can limit limit my practice. But paraprofessionals in our model will have to select their specialization and then go through particular training to be licensed for those specialized specialized areas. So wouldn't we need B? I don't think I, I don't think we need B because they, to the extent that they try to practice outside of that area, they're engaging in UPL and they would pr probably violate 5.5. To the extent they claim that they can practice in areas outside of their licensure, they would violate 7.1 in any communication. So it, it's I think it's this conduct is addressed in other more general rules, in, in my opinion. Okay. And you could also, again, go the comment route if you wanted to call out some particular examples. 
and you could do a comment in 7.1. Like misleading yeah. includes suggesting that, that you can practice in areas that you're not licensed to practice it. Yeah, and that's a, it's an important point. I, I think the, the comments are, that's a, exactly what the comments are supposed to do. They're supposed to provide interpretive guidance for the more general rule um, so people know how it actually applies in real life. Yeah, I agree. This might be a good comment. For I'd some. go for that too. Yeah. So we're past our time. As always, these uh, rules it's discussions. So fun. Are, uh, I know, we just keep at it all day. So um, talking about what we call these uh, paraprofessionals. Uh, I know. Come on, that's so much fun. fun. Reba has come up with one. Maybe we'll do a contest. We should. Um, so we have one more meeting before our meeting on the 26th where the working group, and Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, is slated to vote on the recommendations that were brought forward in December, as well as your proposal for what we're calling quote unquote proactive regulation. Um, I, th the rules piece is going forward in April. So Greg, I'm wondering if you feel, how you feel about us using the next meeting to finalize the rest of the, you know, the recommendations that have to go forward for the 26th. Mm -hmm. If you, but because we still have several uh, rules sort of policy issues to get through. Right. I actually, I, I think we're in pretty more, well, I shouldn't just, I think we're in pretty good shape, but I think what what might be helpful between now and then, I just sent staff a set of the revised rules that I hope reflects most of our discussions so far. I, what I also did, Amos, was I took um, some of the suggested rules you had around informed consent and written agreements and tried to fold them into, in that particular case, I actually created a new rule, um, uh, five point, uh, 1.5.2 and tried to fold that in as well. And I think what might be helpful is I can write a brief email that just sort of explains the roadmap and then send the red line of the rules to you all. And then perhaps from that, we can develop an agenda so that we can move more quickly through the next meeting. Okay. I thought, so at the next meeting, they're not gonna be discussing the proactive regulation? No, we are. That's what I'm saying. Okay. We're not, yeah. we're not gonna do rules. Greg, okay. was I clear? Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't I think, think we'll be able to discussing rules. Yeah, because I've invited Tom Gordon, Jason Solomon. We're gonna get their recommendations and we just have to kind of wrap that all up. But what you're saying is we have until April to actually bring up the rules so that so I so the next time we will meet about the rules, perhaps that's the way we can work through them. Yeah. Okay. And we could set another meeting before the meeting on the 26th to come back to the rules discussion um, because we don't have to generate, you know, a, a written proposal for the meeting on the 26th. It's just the next meeting, the 11th, will be kind of the deadline to get together whatever written recommendation is going to go forward on the 26th. Well, I'll leave that up to you guys if you want to have another meeting between now and the, and the general group meeting. I, I, I can certainly get out the, these revised rules to you in the next um, few days with a with you know a, a written narrative of what I exactly I did. Okay. But the idea is that the rules are not going to be up for vote at the twenty sixth. So the oh yeah no not at all not the and and Amos part of your um, the December recommendation does include rules proposals. Now, I think they were conceptual, the aspects up for vote versus um, the actual language. But maybe there was one where you actually wanted the group to vote on language. I, I would suggest we bifurcate, we pull that out for the February meeting because the way that the whole overall roadmap for the working group is structured, they're gonna consider all the rules uh, proposals in April for the, have a first pass on it and then vote on the rules in June. So perhaps we pull out from the December recommendations, the rules related items and bring them into the package that's gonna go forward in April. There was mandatory disclosures, there was something else I believe yeah, I think that really I, just leaves us with the MCLE and the financial responsibility then. Yeah. 
And if and you those want ones that you're talking referring to, Leah, are the ones that I've actually folded into the rules of professional conduct. Okay, good. And some of the rules that some of the aspects of some of the rules that Amos had put forward are already in our rules of professional conduct. They just need to be identified for everyone to know that they're already there. <laughs> right. You know, like you need to return unearned fees at the end of that's right. part of our rules. So okay. Okay. Well, you guys, you can decide whether or not you not want another meeting. It sounds like we don't need another meeting between now and the general meeting. Well, the only reason to do it is just because it's so much fun to talk about rules, but also because it's kind of fresh, at least for me, um, mm -hmm. because I don't know this, like you all know it, it's helpful to keep going while it's sort of fresh in the mind. That would be the only reason, but I'll just check in with Amos and Fariba and we'll see what you guys okay. can do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Bye. Nice talking again, everybody. Take care. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.